pleasure to get to stand up here uh, a couple of times a year <laughs> when uh, he needs a break or needs to uh, be gone for a moment then I can I'm glad to be able to uh, step in and teach a little bit um, it's fun uh, teaching this stuff and learning this stuff and I hope that uh, this weekend has uh, been beneficial to you uh, all so far and we've got a lot more teaching left to go yet um, the title of my lesson this afternoon is God wasn't talking to you and uh, it, it was not intended to necessarily be a plug for the title of the book uh, that we do have in the back uh, for you to pick up your free copy. <laughs> Jesus wasn't talking to you. Of course, Jesus was God, so it's essentially it's the same title. <clears throat> but uh, that, that book is back there, and, and that will be helpful to you as you, as you study these things. Uh, but uh, what we've learned this morning so far, in the first session, we learned that... Uh, our, our proper position on how we approach God, right? God sing, sees things differently than we see them. And if we don't understand that fact first, we're not going to get very far in our Bible study. Yeah. Second hour, Justin taught us, or uh, Justin taught the first hour, Brother Terry taught the second hour uh, that God's words are better than our words. And I really think that speaks a little bit to how we approach the Bible. And we sung about it in a hymn uh, just a minute ago about how the, we come to the Bible alone uh, without uh, tradition and without scholars and without other languages and this sort of business as our final authority. If God wrote this book, uh, then we stand on it alone for our truth. Amen. And so since this book does contain God's words to mankind, we come to it to discover what God would have us to do. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we've come to a place uh, where there's a lot of confusion about that. Uh, and I think the confusion stems from the fact that most people don't realize that God wasn't always talking to them when he wrote something down in the Bible. Uh, most Christians today have a penchant for picking up the Bible and finding a verse that fits their agenda, which speaks a little bit to what we talked about this morning. Yeah. What we're going to do this afternoon is, is amplify that point a little bit more and start to realize how we can understand, well, if God wasn't talking to me here... How do I know that? And where does God speak to me through his word? Okay. Um, so which verses are the verses we're to follow? I'll let you guys turn to Genesis chapter 6 for a second while I draw a little picture. <clears throat> Just a little one. It won't take me much time. I have an article that I'd like to read as well. Now, interestingly enough... Most people understand the concept of God wasn't always talking to you. They get that. Most people get that. This man does not get that. Inspired by a dark dream, a Dutchman is building a massive vessel to biblical proportions. Oh if you'll engage uh, with me just for a second here. While Noah will likely always remain the first name in arcs, tourists are chomping at the bit to climb aboard Johan's Ark which is an, ambition re an, an ambitious recreation of the biblical boat that's attracting gawkers galore in the Netherlands. The Dutch builder Johan Hubers is expected to complete his work on the massive vessel sometime next month in what has been a staggeringly ambitious project to bring one of the best-known stories of the Bible to life. Taking three years and $1.6 million out of his pocket, the owner of this construction company in Holland says the project is a dream come true literally. And here is where he gets off the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Huber says, I dreamed a part of Holland was flooded. Then the next day I get the idea to build an Ark of Noah. Now, I will give most of Christendom the benefit of the doubt that they're not opening their Bibles and saying, you know what? God wants me to build an Ark. Most people are not doing that. Most people who call themselves Christians are not building an Ark. And if if someone came to you and said, you know what, I'm really looking for God's instructions in the Bible. Could you help me find them? If you turned to Genesis 6.14 and showed them this verse and said, well, here's something God said. <laughs> and it's a directive. I think he might be talking directly to you. It says, make thee an ark of gopher wood. I mean, that's a command from the Lord. I think you should do that. I think most people would look at you, roll their eyes, and turn around and walk away. Except for John Hubers in the Netherlands. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I bring this up because I was going to start my lesson by saying 
we could probably all come to the Bible and understand that beyond Genesis, aside from beyond Genesis 6, nobody's building an ark for their instructions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I read this article. I thought, well, I can't say that because some people are building arks because they think that's what God wants them to do. Yeah. The guy had a dream. He thinks uh, Holland's going to flood. And he, he, God reminded him of this story in the Bible. And so he, that must be what God wants him to do. And so he was actually taking his instructions from Genesis 6, very literally, I might add, building it to the size and proportions of, of what the Bible lays out the ark uh, was to be built in. Of course, he couldn't find gopher wood, so he had to come up with something else. But, you know, that's just a small detail. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but like I said before, the problem is, is that most of Christianity, most of Christianity... Uh, comes to the Bible looking for something to do. They want to know what God has for them. What is he saying to me? What does he want me to do? And, and if you don't have the right tools in place, and if you don't understand God's perspective on the Bible, then you will be very confused. And I'd like to demonstrate how something is, what sounds as silly as building an ark to most people actually happens all over the Bible. Okay? Yeah. And so, for example... Uh, if you'll turn to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Here in Exodus 20, we read the Ten Commandments, so labeled. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, lists the fourth of these commandments. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, there are very successful Christian businesses who on this point alone make their stand. Yes. The Bible says, God said to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, and here's my verse. Right? In fact, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, verse 9, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt do uh, not do any work nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And this is the banner verse for Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A. Yep. I mean, they stand on this as this is, we run our business because this is what God said in his word. And You'll kind of get it as I, as I move through these examples that we can laugh at Mr. Hubers for building an ark, and yet every church down the road thinks that Sunday is the Sabbath day and that yeah. we're to keep it holy, whether they go to work or not later in the afternoon. You're right. Okay? And so if you drive around Kokomo during an election year, you will see signs posted in the yard, and they say, pray. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Oh. Turn to Second Chronicles seven fourteen. <clears throat> I'm drawing too big. If you've seen any of my chart lessons before, you know I have lots of things to draw. <clears throat> Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If you uh, <laughs> if you go to PrayForAmerica.net. It is the ministry of some peoples to provide these signs and tracts and pamphlets for um, people to put in their yards, hand out to people during election years mostly because of what uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14 says. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And the whole ministry of PrayForAmerica.net is based on this verse yeah. because they see that America is in shambles. And they may be right yeah. about that, yeah. but they're wrong to put this sign in their yard. Amen. Yeah. And we'll get to why that is later. But my point right now is that people get what they do from the Bible. The doctrine drives people's decisions. And if, and if you do not understand God's purpose and God's plan for what's going on, you can't approach his word appropriately. And you get out of it not what God would have you to do. Okay? And so you see these signs all around Kokomo during election years because they want their man to get elected because this is how God will heal their land, apparently. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, just, it's just so far from the truth. Turn over to Psalm 23.1. <clears throat> Psalm 
there are uh, there are, if there's there are a few things that anybody who's familiar at all with church knows. This is one of them, isn't it? You hear it at every funeral, don't you? Yes. I actually raise sheep at home. That's why that drawing is so good. <laughs> I have to look at them every day. Psalm 23, 1. For the Lord is my shepherd, right? I shall not want. And doesn't everyone like to hear that at a funeral? Because it seems so comforting. Yeah? And, and unfortunately, um, the Lord is not your shepherd. No. And people then, you start to lose people at this point. Because they're starting to catch on to you. And they're like, what? Well, it says right there in the Bible, the Lord is my shepherd. But what we, fail, what we fail to do at this point is study to understand this verse. We just read it. And at face value, you're putting yourself in for the my. You don't do that with any other book that you read. Yeah. Yeah. Any other book that you read, you say, the Lord is my shepherd. You open it up to the middle of the book. You say, the Lord is my shepherd. The first thing that I would be asking is, who? Who's my? Who is that? And the book, you start reading chapter, you know. And so I'm not saying that, that, the, that we should treat the Bible like any other book. What I am saying is when people come to the Bible, they put their brains on the shelf mm -hmm. and, and they come to it with a selfish, uh, a shelf, a selfish uh, viewpoint that they want to put themselves in the center of everything that the Bible is talking about. And it just isn't so. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of delve into these deeper as we go on through this lesson. But I just want to point some of these things out to you so we have a framework from which to, to, uh, to learn from. Brother Terry um, and I really should start communicating before we uh, teach our lessons at the <laughs> seminar because he's wonderful at taking uh, good examples uh, from the scripture to use in his uh, lessons and they just happen to be the same ones that I want to use. <laughs> so I'll repeat it here. Uh, but we said that you know most, most people are familiar with Psalm 23.1 because of funerals uh, preached inappropriately. Yeah. And most people are familiar with the so-called Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. In fact, uh, a lot of families uh, that uh, celebrated Thanksgiving a few weeks ago, they all gather around the table, and so they need to be uh, somewhat more pious on this day, they feel, uh, because of their family history. This is what they've always done. Grandpa used to say the Lord's Prayer around the turkey, and so that's what we do. And so everybody recites the Lord's Prayer over turkey, and, uh, and they read it right out of here. And... And, and they do silly things like make excuses for what the verses say. Yeah. And, and I'm not going to reteach uh, what Brother Terry already taught, but his, his point was, was valid. Is people come to these verses and they pick them out and they use them for their agenda or they, or they, yeah. or they take them because they've always used them. They've always done it this way. And yet it's not what God would have them to do. Yeah. And uh, as we learn how to study the Bible, we start to figure out how this can be. And, um, and people can, can learn these things on their own. In Acts 2, uh, verses 1 through 4, I know I'm kind of moving fast through these, but I want to paint a picture for you of what modern-day Christianity takes from the Bible. And they, take a, they, they actually, for as often as we say that uh, modern Christianity doesn't use the Bible enough, and I, I would agree with that statement, the things that they do somewhere along the line have been generated from some bad interpretation of the Bible in most cases, yeah. right? And so a lot of what they're doing is tradition or it's morphed from tradition, but it stemmed from somewhere, some doctrine, some teaching in the word that, that has gone awry, okay? Yes. And so there's a lot of Christianity today that believes that Acts 2 is the birthday of the church, mm. right? They think this is where everything started. And... Because of that misunderstanding, birthday hat, <laughs> okay, so the 12 apostles are in the upper room having a birthday party. This is the start of the church, right? And so there's a, the, the, the largest uh, growing movement of Christianity, the Pentecostal movement, puts their flag right here. And they say, well, look what they were doing in Acts 2 when the church started. The premise is wrong. We need to try to do that too. And thus follows all of the things that are incorrect from, yeah. from their teachings. Amen. This is the largest growing segment of, Christi of Christianity out there today, right? 
What's a uh, what's another thing? Man, I draw too big. We were just. Uh, you're not going to be able to read this, but I'm going to write it up here anyway. I'll tell you what it says. As much as they'd like to, people cannot avoid Paul. He wrote 13 books. I mean, even if they're small, they're in there. And some people will try to discount them different ways. But the most popular way is just to say that he was the greatest missionary. Yeah. Right? That's why he's in there, because this guy knew how to evangelize. He went all over the place. Look at all these churches he started. He was a great traveling minister, right? And so they, they come to Paul's epistles, Acts 13, 2, for example. They read things like this. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, what spiritual people. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, they departed unto all these places. And they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And also, and so they, they go to Acts chapter 15 and Acts chapter 13, and they see Paul going around with these other ministers and going to all these churches and talking to all these people. And they think, wow, he must have been a great missionary. Look how much he gave up, and he was willing to travel and, and do all these things. And they completely missed the point yeah. of why Paul's books are even in, in the scripture. One last thing that seems like all, most of Christianity is somewhat aware of. I know there's a segment that isn't. But it, aren't, aren't people always scared about this? That's a lightning bolt. God's, God's impending doom coming you know, to the world. The world's going to, you know, Armageddon. You know, the study of Revelation in the end times. Hot topic. Uh, Christian bookstores always have books about this type of thing. Fiction, mostly. Uh, and, and yet this is something that most of Christianity is cognizant of, and it's in the Bible. Revelation 16. Just take a look. We shouldn't be afraid of what's in this book, by the way. Amen. <clears throat> when you have the proper tools to understand your Bible, there's, there's nothing to be afraid of in it. Revelation 16, 17. This sounds like a bad day. Seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great, and that city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. That is not a good time. And, the, you know, the whole of the book of Revelation talks about these kinds of events, and people are aware of this. And so, you know, in their general uh, concept of what, you know, God is and what is going on, what has happened, you know, they, under, they, they, they see these things. And it's almost as if it's just random pieces of information that the Bible talks about, and they can't really understand, but they're aware of. And that's really a terrible way to try to understand what God is doing and what he would have you to do. And so what is really important here is that people need to, need to grasp a, a bigger understanding of the Bible. Because in most of these instances, God was not talking to you or I. Yeah. Okay, And that, the theme of the lesson is that. God was not talking to you. And that shouldn't be so hard to accept if we've gotten past the first two points of this weekend's seminar, which is that uh, God sees things differently than we do, and God's words are better than ours, and so we can trust that what it says is what it needs to say. But we need to understand how all of this is put together to help us make sense of all of this stuff, to help keep us in the right direction uh, and then we, we, we see that we don't have to wonder whether or not we should be working on Sundays or putting placards in our yard or asking God to watch over us like we're sheep or provide us our daily food every day. And so how do we do that? Well, let's take just the examples that we've looked at so far and let's put them into context. And that's really the solution mm -hmm. to the problem. Is This is not a book of sayings. This is not a book... Of, of mottos and self-help. It's not a very positive book, as Justin pointed out, either. 
And that uh, can be testified from very early on. Of course, the first, you know, we would be remiss to not bring this verse up because the first verse in the Bible actually gives us a huge clue for how God's purpose is put together. And it's so often ignored. Genesis 1-1, God created the heaven and the earth, right? So we've got these two places that God created. And if we can kind of keep that in mind as we go through the Bible to study all of these things, then it all starts to make a little more sense. I went through these examples that we drew on the board in order, uh, chronologically speaking, uh, because I think one of the best ways to show people that God wasn't talking to you is to give them this framework from a chronological perspective, in time order, right? So we start at the beginning and say, in the beginning, God created these two places. What happened then? Well, we read in Genesis 6 that God said to make thee an ark of gopher wood. When you're talking about learning about the things that are in the Bible in their context, it really requires you to do a little more reading outside of the single verse that you think you're going to put on a flag and run with. Yeah. And all you have to do is go back a couple of verses, say uh, verse 11 of chapter 6 in Genesis. The earth was also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So, implication, right? So, make thee an ark of gopher wood. And he explains what, you know, what he needs to do. This isn't just a story of a magnificent construction that houses lots of creatures. Uh, they, they turned it, uh, Mr. Hubers here turned his boat into a zoo. He's putting the finishing touches on his ark. Uh, with the help of his two children and some friends, uh, he plans to make the the floating faux zoo a first class tourist attraction because of his dream that he had that Holland was going to get flooded. I I, I can't I can't stop there. Uh, so he filled it with fake animals uh, that cost about eleven thousand dollars each, and uh, then it says unfortunately for the Netherlands. Huber's dream of 20 years ago has become a reality. In the Oscar-winning documentary An Inconvenient Truth, former U.S. Ah. Vice President Al Gore warned of the future melting of Greenland's ice, which he said would be absolutely devastating to the low-lying Netherlands, which is where Huber's dreamed about that would be flooded. And so when they asked Huber's if his ark would be able to serve as a refuge, should such a catastrophe occur, Huber's replied, I don't think so. <laughs> he doesn't want to get sued, see. Uh, if the world would happen to flood, which is what he was worried about in his dream, for which he built this giant ark, as the Bible has instructed, he wouldn't want anybody thinking that it actually saved him from the flood because he wouldn't want to get into trouble. So, But he's making some good money, okay? Uh, so... <laughs> And, and I, I think it's good to go to that because most of us in the room can laugh at that as, as being as, as obviously silly, an obviously wrong application of the Bible. And yet I think what you find is when you start to understand God's purpose laid out in the Bible, the way he intended it, that all of these examples start to be just as strange, yeah. okay, just as uh, inappropriate. But we look, we look in this passage in Genesis 6 and we find out who is speaking to whom and what is the context, what is going on. This isn't a story about a floating boat with animals on it and rainbows. That is not what the story is about. I drew this on my chart last year and, and I, think it's, I just think it's appropriate because this is a, a story of sin and judgment. Amen. Okay? This is, a, this is a, not a happy story. God, God destroyed the earth because of the wickedness and the evilness that was upon it. And there were dead people floating in that water that the ark was on because of all of that. And that, that's not a happy story. It's a story that, you're, that our children should learn, but not in the, in the way that it's taught in most Sunday school classes. Amen. Okay? And so what we learn then is, from the Bible's perspective, that is a, a story about sin and judgment, <coughs> not uh, animals and, uh, not just animals and rainbows. Turn over to Genesis 12. It didn't take the world long between the ark and Genesis 12 to uh, start heading the wrong way again. <clears throat> so 
So in Genesis 12, God actually does something here. He intervenes in such a way that will impact history greatly. And we shouldn't miss it. But he pulls out one man, Abram. And, he's, and he, in effect, he says here in Genesis 12, 1 through 4, The Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. What happens here is, is God looks at the world post-flood and he, he decides that he's going to create a nation and it's through this singular nation that God will work uh, from, from that point on in the Bible uh, for quite a long time. And so uh, it's important to realize this because this is really the first key to unlocking why all of this stuff doesn't make sense for us to do. Okay. So in Genesis, uh, Genesis 12, we start, see the start of God creating this nation, Israel, uh, with Abram and his sons, Jacob and, or Isaac and um, Jacob, in that regard. Uh, turn over to Exodus 19. Let's go to our next example, which is the law, the, the Ten Commandments that we looked at, Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A, operate from... <clears throat> Chapter 20, like I said, basically starts the listing of the Ten Commandments here that people want to put in their courthouse lawns and in their public schools and all this business. If you go back to the previous chapter, you get a better idea of what's going on here. In, in chapter 19, verse 3, Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. So again, we have God talking. He's talking to Moses, and he's telling him that he's going to communicate the following to a specific group of people. Uh, the house of Jacob, the children of Israel. Um, go, skip down to verse 5. Therefore, if you, will keep, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses to bring down from the mountain, he gave them for, an, uh, for a specific purpose, to define for these people that Moses is talking to, the house of Jacob, the children of Israel, what their nation was going to look like and who they were going to be and how they were going to operate. And so we, we kind of get this uh, first inkling of uh, the kingdom that Israel... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's a little yes. There's a little kingdom out here in the future. God promised to Israel, he said, if you will keep my covenant, my law, that he then gives them in the next chapter, Moses reads out aloud to them, then I will make you a nation and a kingdom of priests. And so we start to get a better idea of why the law existed and what its function uh, for Israel was. Uh, you don't get that just by reading Exodus 20, verse 8, which is where people go to pluck out their verse about why they're not working on Sunday and why you've got to be here on Sunday. Um, and that is just, that's just not what the context of the passage is talking about. Uh, <clears throat> so our next example here was this, uh, this business of, oh, I drew that little kingdom and I, I forgot to mention that it's actually going to happen. Uh, you read, you know, the end of the book, uh, Revelation, the end of the, the whole Bible, rather, uh, you know, Revelation talks about the, the city coming down and the kingdom being there and all that business in Revelation 21. And, and that, we, we see that as early, you know, as Exodus 19, where God promised that to a specific people. So it's not that we can just say we're building God's kingdom, you know, or we're trying to get God's kingdom to come down, because God's kingdom was attached to something. It was attached to Israel and the covenant that they had to keep with him. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's not good Bible study to, to use that, that language so flippantly. Yeah. Uh, and so that's this hiding under there. On the other side of Raph, there's your kingdom. Uh, so these covenants that, uh, th that we have uh, are given to Israel by God for a certain reason. And that really ties into our uh, Second Chronicles 714 sign. Because that's what was going on in Second Chronicles 7.14. Uh, 
Solomon was praying and in, invoking that covenant that he knew he had with God as the king of Israel, he could actually pray that. Isn't it amazing? This always fascinates me. There are certain people in the Bible who are more prominent than others. King David, King Solomon. People go back to these guys, the Psalms, the, you know, the Song of Solomon, and they say, well, these guys were smart, and they were in good with God. We ought to just read what they're saying, and, and, and we can learn some stuff from that. No doubt we can learn things from them. But I would really disrespect the position that those two guys were in. They were the king of God's nation. Okay, the only nation that God ever created, that God ever dealt with, that God ever had a deal with, was Israel. And those guys were the leaders, the king. And we disrespect that, their position, when we say that we can say to God the things that they said to God. Because that's, that really comes to, to the Bible without understanding the, the position that God gave them to have. And so we really need to be careful when we're going to those places. But turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Dealing with this business of covenants. Deuteronomy 4, uh, 29. <coughs> says, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn unto the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he sware unto them. That is all King Solomon was doing in Second Chronicles 7.14. Yes. Okay? He was going back to the law, to the covenant that, that God had made with Israel, and he was... He was putting it to action. He was putting it to use. God had provision for this. And, and so Solomon's praying this in 2 Chronicles 14 to have the land healed in a most literal sense, not in the figurative sense that it's usually used today. And he's praying this to God to make this happen. Solomon being the king of Israel, the, the representative of the nation uh, that, that God had set up. And so there's a context to these things. There's, there's a... There's a bigger picture to which these, all of these events in the Bible are happening that we would do well to respect and to understand. And uh, then we don't have to read ourselves into these personal pronouns so much when we understand where we fit into God's big picture, which, by the way, we haven't really got to yet. Uh, but as you can see, each of these things that, that Christianity today kind of plucks out and uses for their own agenda have a context in God's big picture, which is often different than what people want it to be for themselves. The next thing we talked about was Psalm 23.1 with the sheep. If you look in the same book, Psalm 100, verse 3, we can, we can give you one instance of many that defines whose sheep are in your Bible. Make a joyful noise, verse 1 says, all ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Verse 3, know ye that the Lord, he is God, it is he that hath made us, that's talking about Israel there, and not we ourselves. Israel was a nation like no other nation. God made it, not people. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Amen. Okay, so Israel understood the teaching that they were a nation of 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 sheep, uh, and that the Lord was their shepherd. So to step in and say that the Lord is my shepherd is is taking that verse out of context and applying it to yourself when it was never meant for you. <clears throat> Matthew 10 reiterates this point. The red letters are so precious to people, aren't they? Yeah. And you know what we do? We, we kind of we kind of use that term derogatorily, I think. The red letters. From up here, we, you know, if you're always preaching from the red letters and all this. And people say, well, those were the words of Jesus. And no doubt, they were. But what does that say about the rest of this book? Yeah. That Jesus, who was God, wrote. Right? And so I think that's, that's, that's why we say that, is to, is to bring import to the whole Bible. Amen. And not just the letters that are in red. <clears throat> 
But anyway, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, uh, the 12, they haven't celebrated the birthday of the church yet, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So here they're, they're going to go out to the lost sheep. They understood who that was. Yeah. They knew who that was. Uh, that uh, Sheep are always, always a reference to Israel in the Bible. And, and the uh, 12 apostles knew then what their job was to preach the, the kingdom that was promised them before was coming when the, Mas when the Messiah uh, was going to bring it in. And since Jesus had come to them, they were ready for it to happen. And so we find ourselves now in, in these red letters, and these are the instructions that Jesus gave in his earthly ministry. And it's fascinating the, amount of, the number of people who don't consider the context in which all, all this happened. It's almost as if we were reading, um, I was reading a, a, a book that to retold Bible stories for kids to understand them. And we were looking through some of these, and uh, one of them was talking about uh, David and when David was chosen by God to be king and, and Nathan the prophet was talking to him about this and uh, David went and, and uh, knelt before God and, and talked to God and assured God that he wanted you know his seed to last forever and his kingdom to last forever as God had promised them and in the next paragraph the author of this book in trying to tell this story to the children says and we too, just like David, can approach God and, and ask him for our kingdoms to last forever too. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I mean he literally said that in there. And, and, and so people, they, they want to be selfish about the scriptures. And they, they just want to take as much as they can get and apply it to themselves. And it's just not, it's not right to do so, but it's also not fair to God in the sense that uh, he, he had a purpose that you weren't always in. And uh, so we need, we, need to re we need to respect that. And so the people here in Matthew 10, they knew what they were to do. They knew who they were going to speak the gospel of the kingdom to. Um, and so we have that. That's kind of the, the next important thing that was going on that, the, that we want to note up here is that when Jesus came to earth as a man, he came for a specific purpose. And that was to fulfill the things that were promised to Israel back then. And so they'd always been looking for this kingdom to come out here. And so when he came, they were preaching the good news that that kingdom was coming and was going to be here soon. Um, and again, we've, we've looked at how it's been promised before. You can look back um, uh, in Exodus chapter 4 and 2 Samuel 7 to find out how God uh, was had promised these things to, to Israel. Uh, but part of this whole thing was that God was also going to execute judgment and wrath on the earth again. Amen. And if you look at Isaiah 66, yeah, people know about it in Revelation. <clears throat> That's scary times. But they knew about this too. They knew this was coming. Or is still coming. Yeah. Isaiah 66, 15. The Lord will come with fire, with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Not going to be a good day, uh, but we do we can learn about God's wrath. <clears throat> and this is the kingdom on the earth out here. Now what we've done is we've started to take these random stories, if you will. I, I don't like to use that term, but that's how modern Christianity looks at them. Yeah. And we've started to kind of string them together and understanding why they're there at all. And that will help, kind of help us guide us to whether or not we should be um, participating in those, those doctrines the way they're being taught in Christianity today, <laughs> or whether we should be filled in both. Uh, Whatever, uh, but uh, so we've outlined these these different these different aspects of God's program for His dominion and glory on the earth. Okay. Now, at this at this well, I guess we got one more to cover, and that's the that's what the apostles were were preaching here. What the what the apostles were preaching in Acts two was nothing new. Turn to Acts two. Acts 
Acts 2, 1, 1 through 4 is uh, obviously where they like to go to show that superpowers are going to come and all this business. But in verse 14, Peter, at this event of Pentecost, stands up and says that in verse 16, rather, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So whatever's going on in Acts 2 is not new. That's exactly, that's exactly right. It's not new, but it's something that has already been talked about. And, he, and in saying this, he's addressing people who understand the context that he's talking about as well. By, by standing up and saying to all these people there at Pentecost, he says, it's written in the book of Joel, this stuff that's going on. So he's taking something that they already knew about back here in Law and Prophets and, and all that business and saying, this is what's happening now. And so... <clears throat> He's doing nothing but preaching prophecy uh, that has already been known by Jews before. So th this can't be anything new like what people would like to make it the, the birthday of the church. The first time the church was, you know, this is when the church was created. Uh, in fact, if you look at Acts chapter 3, verse 24 and 25, he reiterates in this sermon that all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after... As many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Amen. So again, he's saying from a long time, all of God's dealings with Israel have led up to this. And they're expecting this kingdom to happen rather quickly. Jump up a few verses. And in this same dialogue, Peter says in verse 19 that they need to repent and be converted that their sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord which is this kingdom on earth that he's talking about and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things all of this stuff which I've been talking about God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began so again you've got Peter teaching the, the people there in Acts 2 and Acts 3, the supposed birthday of the church, which really isn't. These guys were going to be princes judging. That's my prince hat. <laughs> judging in the kingdom. They weren't having a birthday party. <clears throat> He's telling them that this is stuff that they should already know. It's been preached since the world began. And we've looked at all of these things that since the world began. And he said... He said God was talking to you, Israel, when he was talking about all of these things since the world began. And that kingdom is coming, Peter's preaching right here. But we read in Romans 16, curious language. Romans chapter 16, of course written by Paul, the great missionary. <laughs> Romans 16:25. Paul teaches, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. That statement is a polar opposite of what Peter said in Acts 3. Catch that. Because Peter said that what he was teaching here and what, what was going on here is all that has been preached since the world began which was God's purpose for the earth. Paul says that what he's preaching, how he's preaching Jesus Christ, has been kept secret from the beginning of the earth. <coughs> more space. And so Paul's pointing out here that what he's got and what he's teaching isn't just great ways to do evangelical ministry work. But it's something different. He's teaching information that has been hidden, kept secret, since the world began. And he calls it a mystery. So while all this is going on, there's information unknown that Paul says that he is making known. If you turn over to Ephesians 3, 1 through 5, you see it again. Amen. 1 
For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now, if that doesn't strike anybody who's been following the lesson thus far as interesting, then you need to read it again. Because all we've been talking about since about a half hour ago has been Israel, Jews, covenants, this sort of business. And in fact, in Matthew 10, uh, didn't Jesus say, don't go to the Gentiles, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Now, Paul, he was a good missionary. I mean, he went to even the heathen, right? Prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which has given me to you word. Dispensation uh, was, it needn't be a more difficult word than you want to make it, okay? We've used the example of a Pez dispenser before. Pez dispenser, you know what it is. It's a little thing with the head on top. You pop the head back and candy shoots out. This device is a dispenser, and what comes out of it is the dispensation. It is what has been dispensed, yes? And so God has dispensed information to Paul to reveal to the rest of the world information that was hidden from the beginning of time, okay? Uh, in verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. He made known unto me, Paul, the mystery that was hidden Romans 16, 25, from before. Uh, now jump over to Colossians 1. I'm getting redundant to drive a point home, lest we miss it. Because this is, this is the point that most of Christianity misses, right? Paul wasn't the greatest missionary. <laughs> he was the apostle of the Gentiles. Amen which shouldn't be lost on you. Yeah. Because God didn't go to Gentiles. God wasn't talking to Gentiles, of which most of us in the room would fall into that category, being non-Jews. Of course, in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. God's yeah. not concerned with Jews and Gentiles today. It's kind of the point. But you can understand why this is so revolutionary in that God wasn't dealing with Gentiles before, and all of a sudden, he has an apostle specifically for them. Colossians 1.25, Paul's made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to him for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. So in Romans 15, then, Paul says, in contrast to the fact that Jesus was a minister of the circumcision, in Romans 15, 8, Paul was given grace by God that he should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be made acceptable. And so when we're looking at the big picture to better understand how to, how to, understand, how to use this book, how God gave his word to humanity, and how most of the people who approach God's word just want to pluck and pick and choose what fits their agenda, that they ignore the context, and that's where they get into trouble. Yes. And so we are trying to get a big picture of what God is doing in this entire book, and what we've seen so far is that from the very beginning of the book, when God created two places, God, con God continually talks about and deals with his purpose on the earth until we get to Paul. And then we read about the function that God has in store for the other place that he created, which, has, which was hidden from all of this time and from all of these people. It was hidden information until Paul revealed it. How fortunate are we to be living on this side of that revelation? Amen. <clears throat> but they didn't know any of it. And so for people today who live on this side of that revelation to go back here and take these things as if they were for them is to ignore what God is doing. Amen. Okay? And, uh, and, and yet I think most, most people are, have a sincere heart to want to do what God does, and that's why they're going to, to the Bible. Maybe Mr. Hubers, I hate to be so judgmental, Mr. Hubers, but uh, uh, you seem to be contradictory in your article about uh, your purpose for building that boat. Yeah. But, um, but anyway... Uh, we can we can better understand these things if we understand the, the big picture, okay? And so we have uh, we have now this mystery revealed. 
I'll use a different color. With Paul, we have this mystery revealed. That we can now understand and we can start to better we can start to better figure out what our instructions are from, from God's word. Now, what, I, what we can do then is we can study this mystery information that Paul was given. We can read about it. We can learn about it. And when we study it in light of the instructions that God gave in the past, we see that what God would have us to do is quite different from what he instructed other people to be doing uh, under his earthly program with Israel. Amen. For instance, Romans 5, verse 1 through 6. You know, back here in the ark, God was passing judgment on the world, save the eight people on the boat for the sin and the evil that was in the world. And yet, Romans 5, verse 1, we learn a truth from Paul. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Despite the fact, verses 6 through 8, that we were sinners and that we were enemies of God. The enemies of God here were floating in the water. But we have peace with God. So there's, there's, a, there's an understanding that we have here about how we can approach things that have God has talked about in his word, knowing what we know now from the revelation of the mystery. Uh, Colossians 3, verses 10 through 11, we learn that... Not, God is not dealing with a nation today. Amen. He's dealing with a new man. We have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created us, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision. So instead of Israel, we're dealing with one body. This is what God, this is how God is, is uh, this is God's mechanism for, for working his channel through which he's working today on the planet. And uh, Ephesians 2.15 says that he's made of twain, two things, Jews and Gentiles, not Jews, one new thing. So the, that'd be the one body of Christ. We learn from Romans 3.21 and 6.14, we sang in the song that we are not under the law, but under grace. We learn about the liberty that we have through Christ and his work on the cross. Which, by the way, Christ's finished cross work was part of the hidden mystery Amen. given to Paul. These people didn't know that, which would, would definitely affect how they were operating. Ephesians 1, 3 and Colossians 2, 10 says we are complete in Christ. We have all spiritual blessings. We don't have covenants. We don't need them. Christ's work is sufficient enough and we are complete in him apart from covenants, apart from the law, apart from oaths and everything else. Here, Israel was a nation of sheep that needed a shepherd, but not us. Ephesians 5.30 For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. 1 Corinthians 12.12 restates that also. <clears throat> For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, right? So instead of a nation of sheep that need a shepherd, we're in the body of Christ, with Christ as our head. Revolutionary information that's different. So when you learn the aspects of the mystery, the things that were kept hidden, for a different purpose, it's not that... We often say that God changed his purpose. He did. But it doesn't negate the purpose that he had for Israel. Amen. Amen. Okay, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't make that void. It makes it invalid for us because that's not what God is doing now. But it isn't, to be, it, it isn't different to be contrary to. To say that I'm, I'm finished working with this. That didn't work. I'm closing that down. I'm doing something else. You see, God has a plan for both heaven and earth. Amen. And to accomplish that, to fulfill that, he needs Israel's program and the body of Christ to work in under the mystery program. But it doesn't happen at the same time. And that's, and that's where we really, um, really can clean a lot of this misunderstanding up. 
from that. Um, so as opposed to the gospel of kingdom that the 12 were preaching and that Jesus was ministering on, uh, uh, in his earthly ministry, we have the gospel of the grace of God. That it isn't a, uh, our salvation is a sure thing based on the finished work of Christ's blood on the cross. And not because of our works, not because of a nation we live in or, uh, or the covenants that we have with him. And so we've already talked about how the mystery was hidden here from, from the, uh, the 12. They weren't preaching that in Acts 2. So I hope what, we're, what we've seen here is that we've taken the random events, some of the random events that Christianity likes to hold on to, uh, likes to use as, as uh, that they go to for their banner verses, for their slogans, and for their mottos, and we put them into their context. And by doing that, we're forced to consider the whole book in its context, yeah. which means that we have, to find, we have to figure out what Paul means when he says these things that are so contrary to everything else. And when you study it out, you find, you find out why, and you understand God's, God's, God's purpose and who he was talking to when. And that's the point of God wasn't talking to you. He wasn't always talking to you when he wrote in the Bible the things that pertain to Israel, the things that pertain to Noah. How do we know that? Because Paul says that what he has fulfills the word of God. He was the last to see Christ. And the revelation that was given to him, he's to be the pattern for those that believe on hereafter. There isn't anything else after Paul. What about those other epistles after him? When we study the Bible, we realize those, the guys who wrote those books were these guys here. Right. And the content of which talks about all this stuff over here, which was written for Israel's program. But people don't want to think that hard. See, they, don't, they, don't want to, they don't want to go there because it's going to cause too much thinking, and it's going to cause them to give up things that are too comfortable for them. Exactly. Okay, and so they'd rather just kind of go back to, the, you know, Justin's example of God doesn't see things the way that you do. They would rather just fall into that, back into that, well, I feel more comfortable seeing it the way I would like to see it. But that's being dishonest. That's being dishonest towards yourself and being dishonest towards God. Uh, you know, to just kind of finish up our chart here, First, uh, First Thessalonians 5, 9, Paul says that we aren't children of wrath, but of salvation. We don't, we're not worried about that. We understand it's a real thing. It's going to happen. That's God's judgment on the earth. We're going to be long gone. And that's not something that we need to worry about. And we only learn that through Paul's writing. That's right. And instead of a kingdom on the earth, we're looking for heavenly, we're looking towards heavenly places, of course. Colossians 3, uh, and Ephesians 2 6. So, again, another contrast of the information in your Bible in order to gain the whole picture of what God was doing in the context and who God, to whom God was speaking and when. So, I guess that's the end of our chart lesson for today. All right. Any questions or comments? Yes? Could you not erase the like, scripture? Sure. Yeah. I will leave it up there. I drew. I did draw my art to biblical proportions. You know, so it, it took up too much of the board. Uh, I had to squeeze that stuff in the back. There, but yeah. Any other questions or comments? No. Okay. Since uh, Jeremy shamelessly plugged Terry's book, I'm going to shamelessly plug my chart. <laughs> yeah. Because that's a Jeremy's lesson. Um, those of you who've been getting the updates from our ministry, you know that we did publish this this last year. And these are, like I said before, all the stuff in the back is free. We're not trying to sell you anything or, or anything like that. So please take what you need, take what's available um, for your benefit, okay? Um, this chart goes through a lot of what Jeremy did. He did a great job going through that. that um, it reveals the mystery on the fourth panel. So please grab one of those before you leave. Um, if you speak Spanish, you don't know what I'm talking about right now, but there's one for you back there as well. So, no hablo español. <laughs>